All right, you ready? Lord, I choose to obey your word, for as I dwell and walk in your presence, I shall not lack. Poverty be far from me in my household, in Jesus' name. I will walk in your blessings, Lord. I will rise above all that ail as to offer and accept heaven's best here on earth. I set my hands to, will prosper, because I make you my dwelling place. You are my refuge and my fortress. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. I accept it by faith, fully expecting your blessings in every area of my life. For wherever your presence is, there is no lack. Therefore, Lord, as we receive today's offering, we are believing you for abundant harvest, health, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, scholarships and grants, inventions with royalties, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase, bargains, and child support. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. We, uh, we've spent almost this whole year talking about obstacles and how to overcome. And, uh, uh, you know, I guess when I get on a train of thought, Seems like I stay there a lot, and uh, I'm going to—I'm not really switching off of it. I don't guess, but it might be a little change, uh, just a little bit of change. Uh, I know in my heart that a lot of people don't spend much time in the Old Testament when they're reading or when they're studying. So I'm not going to ask you how many of you knows Nehemiah and the story of Nehemiah. There will be some of you that does. Uh, there's some good stuff there, and by you know I probably could have quizzed you today and asked you uh, who was Nehemiah and what what was his official title and role and all that. Most people would have, probably most people would say, well, he was a minor prophet, okay? Well, I'm going to disagree with you. He actually wasn't a minor prophet, even though that's how most people probably would have classified him. One of the, one of the best scriptures in all the Bible, those found in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, and I, I couldn't find the title. And then I thought, well, I'll just use that one because that's one of my favorite scriptures anyway. How many of you know Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10? Uh, I'm disappointed in you, what can I say? Write it down in your Bible. You'll know it when you hear it, because most of you have heard it over and over, probably in your life. Uh, it's a great message, really. If you listen to prayer time this morning, I shared it this morning, just real
understand through what I've been hearing and what I've learned is that I've allowed a lot of things in my life that don't need to be there, and I want those removed because, and listen, let's look at the title one more time, because I need the joy of the Lord. Now, when I, when I say that and I use that scripture, listen, most people don't know what it means to have the joy of the Lord. And I know that they don't know what it means because they don't have the strength that the joy of the Lord provides in order for us to live daily and overcome the obstacles that we have in life. If the joy of the Lord is my strength and I have the joy of the Lord, that means that I am strong in the Lord. And when you when you put on your armor, that's what Paul told the church. He said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Well, the power of his might, when you have that in your possession, you have the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is not something that the world gives. The joy of the Lord is something that balloons up inside of you in your heart so that no matter what you're looking at, no matter what you're experiencing, you know that God's going to get you through that. You feel good about it. You have a peace about it because the joy of the Lord has made you strong in that situation and you don't give in to the enemy. You don't give in to a fiery dart. You don't give in to all the suggestions or the obstacles that he's trying to place in front of your path. The joy of the Lord. That, that verse, you ought to write it down. It needs to be a foundational scripture that you're building your life on. I'm going to keep I'm going to acquire and keep the joy of the Lord because I need to be strong. And as your pastor that loves you, I want you to know that you need to be stronger now than you've ever been. And the days that are ahead of us, we're going to need more of God's strength than what we ever needed in the past because the world around us is not getting better. The world around us is getting worse and getting worse and getting worse. And Christians who are bold with their faith, who are confident in the Lord, who experience the joy of the Lord, they are a minority in our society. Now, there are a lot of people who confess to be Christians. And today, all over America, there are lots of churches, and there are thousands and thousands of people that are sitting upon church pews, just like ours, all over America. But there are not thousands and thousands and thousands of believers who are strong in the Lord, the power of His might, who experience the joy of the Lord on a daily basis, and, and they know that they're strong. They don't give in to the enemy. The only time that you can be defeated is when you're not strong, when you're not strong in the Lord. Now, if I'm going to go in the battle, do I want to go into that battle with the joy of the Lord, or do I want to go into that battle without the joy of the Lord? That's a pretty obvious answer, isn't it? We want to know God's with us. We want to feel his strength and encouragement. And we want to have the confidence that no matter what this battle looks like, I'm remembering God's already won this battle. And all I'm doing in is going in collecting the spoils of the reward that comes from being victorious. Amen? Now, I preached the title. Let's talk about Nehemiah for a minute. Listen, Nehemiah, really when you get right down to it, Nehemiah was... Uh, he was one of those uh, young men who were carried away captive when the Babylonians came and took Israel out. If you know your history at all, you'll know that Isaiah, Jeremiah, there's a lot of prophets. They prophesied. They said, if you don't repent, listen, it, it's going to go bad. In fact, it was just told them plain as day, you're, you're going to be carried away captive. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. The walls, the temple, everything's going to go. They're going to devastate our country. They're going to kill those who can't uh, travel. They're going to take captive everybody who's going to be useful as slaves. And they, when they went in and destroyed uh, Israel the way they did, the Jewish nation, listen, they kept the best. Daniel was one of the best. Nehemiah was one of the best. Ezra was one of the best. The three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were three of the best. They kept the best. They took them into servitude uh, in a... The Persian king did, and that's who that actually uh, Nehemiah was working for. He was a cupbearer in King Artaxerxes, I can't say that word, in the Persian court. Listen, he, he did what now. The truth is, though, he may have been there, and he may have served them as a servant, but his heart belonged to God. Now, a lot of us have been there before. We, you know, we, we find ourselves in situations that we don't really want to be a part of it, and sometimes it wars against us. But listen, even in the worst situation that we get in, we still have the ability to love God and hold Him supreme in our heart. 
Now, you, you'll learn when you study that they found favor with those that were in authority over them. Daniel found great favor. In fact, the Bible declares him to be one of the most perfect and ideal men the Bible's ever mentioned. But the others found favor too. Nehemiah found favor. And all the time that he was there, his heart still uh, wanted to be home. You know, how many of you know the phrase, there's no place like home? Amen. Uh, you know, that's how I feel about this right here. There's no place like home. When you're here, family's here. No place like home. Nehemiah was, he had that kind of love for his country. He had that kind of love for Jerusalem, the capital, and the temple that they, they once went and sacrificed that. And so all the time that he was there as a slave, his heart, he still thought about home. He still wanted to go back. He wanted to be a part of that. And you know what? Uh, there was nothing to go back to. There was a land there. There was devastation there. It's really amazing when you research it. They cut down every tree. They devastated the land. They killed uh, thousands of the Jewish people because they were weak and old and feeble. There was a remnant that escaped. We, I don't know if we'll ever get to the remnant. I guess we probably will. But listen, the best were carried away into Babylonian, to the Persian. It was, it, was a, it was a messed up time. There's no doubt. So what he did, Jer Nehemiah, he began to pray about what God might want him to do. I believe that. The Bible doesn't say he prayed and asked God. I believe God spoke to him and about going back to Jerusalem. His heart was there. He wanted to do right. And so uh, over a period of time, he began to deal with the king that he worked under about sending him back and about uh, being able to restore the temple and uh, restore Jerusalem even. And when you go over there, if you read all of it, you'll find out that he'd won favor with those that were in, uh, over him. They gave him money. They sent him over back there to restore some things. And you know the important thing about Nehemiah is that Nehemiah was just what I'm going to call an ordinary person. Uh, really, when it gets right down to it, the only thing that he had that maybe we didn't have was he that was a servant to this king and maybe had access to some things that we wouldn't have access to. But the truth is, if God can use a Nehemiah, God can use a William or God can use a, a Darlene. God can use any of us because that's the kind of God that we serve. It's amazing how that well, we can get such a concept of who God is and what God is and what God's not. And oftentimes we're, we're guilty of looking at people and we think, oh, God can really use you, you know, or God can really use them, and we don't think that God can really use us. But I, I believe in my heart that God's got a plan for every boy and every girl. I, I, I do. I, I don't care if they're little like these three right here or if they're big like you are. Listen, God's had a plan for your life ever since you were born. And no telling what kind of captivity that maybe you've been caught up in in your lifetime where that you could not fulfill your role in serving God. Nehemiah was no young man when this is about to come down on him. Listen, I don't know exactly. I didn't, I didn't go that deep to tell you how many years they'd been in captivity, but he was a teenage boy when they went there. Now he's a grown man. And uh, so it's, a, it's completely different now. And when Nehemiah, when God told Nehemiah about going back down to restore the, the walls and the gate, now the temple, they'd been working on the temple. The, rem, the remnant that was there, they were trying to restore the temple. They still loved God, and they wanted worship, and they wanted to worship God, and they knew in their heart how important the temple was. They knew that. But do you know that a temple without walls and gates is almost a useless temple? Now, I want you to get the message today, okay? And I, that's one of the messages that you need to get because a temple without walls and gates is almost a useless temple. And if you aren't aware of it yet, let me, let me inform you that you and I individually, these are temples. It's not just the body that we wear, but inside here is a temple. It's where we serve God. It's where we hear from God. It's where we make our sacrifices to God. It's where we hear from heaven. It's these temples. But when your temple and my temple, when these temples don't have a wall or gates that protect the temple, then the temple becomes almost useless. And when I say it becomes almost useless, I'm saying that it gets virtually impossible for there to be the kind of sacrifices that God expects from us. It gets hard to hear what God's trying to say. And a lot of times we never find our place in our own temple to the Holy of Holies where we get into a connection with our Father. 
Now, Nehemiah understood that the temple was already in construction and rebuilt, and it was actually in a, in a state where that they could restore worship. But there were no walls. The walls had been torn down. The gates had been burned, and so there was no protection for the temple. So Nehemiah understood that there were some things that had to take place in order for this to happen. And so when God sent him back down there, he had like a, a threefold mission. He had to restore order to the remnant of the people that were still there. And not only did he have to restore the order, but he had to stabilize their mindsets so that they could work together and understand we've got a common goal and a common purpose. And it's going to require us working together to make this happen because we have a temple to protect. We have people who need to be able to freely come to the temple. And they need to come to a temple that's not polluted and it's not full of atrocities and so that it's safe for people to enter in there. We're serving a God, and we have, we have a temple here that God's allowed us to build. And it needs to be a holy place where people feel the presence of God, where people understand that it's set apart for God's service, where that they can come together and feel freely, feel God, hear God, know that God's real. Not just in this heart, but also in this place where we live. So he did. He went back with an understanding that he had, it wasn't just a matter of putting up a wall, and it wasn't just a matter of building a few gates. It was a matter of putting the people in a mindset to work. It was about getting them enthused and motivated to go to work. And, and the word here is focus. He had to get them focused on the job at hand. Now, if you haven't figured this out yet, any time that God's people, whether it's you by yourself, you and a spouse, you and a group in the church, we as a church family, Anytime that we get focused on something that we want to accomplish for God that needs to be done, listen, you done got the devil's attention. Because there's nothing that scares the devil more than for Christians to get focused on doing what God wants done. To be focused so that no matter whatever kind of distractions, because the number one thing that we have to deal with in life are all these distractions that are out here. I'm telling you, there ain't anything that you have in your possession that the devil won't use to distract you, to keep you from studying the Word, keep you from praying, keep you from going to church, keep you from talking to your neighbor about God. Let me tell you, everything that you have can be a distraction if you allow the devil to use that because he cannot resist the idea that if he can keep you not focused, then he also knows that work will not be accomplished. So we have to get focused, church. You and I, individually and together, we've got to become more focused in the future than we have in the past. We've got, we've got a temple, but you know what I, I feel in my heart? That we've got some wall that needs to be restructured, but more importantly than that, we've got some gates that need to be built and they need to be shut. And if we don't build some gates and shut some gates, then the temple never becomes everything that it's supposed to be for everyone that is supposed to be for. So Nehemiah goes down there. He gets money. They give him money. They give him material. He goes down there. And uh, it's just proof that God can use. He can use any kind of person. Doesn't matter what manner of person that it is. Who would have thought this cupbearer in the king's court would be coming down here as a construction guy? You know, that, that appeared just a little bit odd. I'm sure that there was some talk going around like, who does he think he is? He's not, he probably don't know one end of the hammer from the other. He probably doesn't know one thing about mixing mortar and building and making bricks and putting them together. I, I can hear him talking. I, we know all about this because that's what the devil does. He's good at it. Nehemiah's got, he's focused. He's focused. He's not caring about what they say. He doesn't care about what his experience is. His idea is to get the people together and, and combine the people's abilities and their talents to do what they know how to do and just to orchestrate order in that process. And that's how our God works. So don't ever think that just because you don't possess a certain set of skills that God's not going to use you in a certain set of ways to accomplish a certain set of goals that God has in store for somebody in your life or in the lives of somebody else. 
Nehemiah, it wasn't about Nehemiah needing this temple for himself. It was about Nehemiah's heart was knowing this temple had to be completed, this walls had to be done, the gates had to be built because there was a remnant of people who needed to come back and serve God and do it the way that Moses had instituted it in the temple to reestablish the Levitical law so that people could be in favor with God, offer sacrifices, get their sins covered because that was what God expected and wanted from his children. And Nehemiah, he, I'm telling you, he got the job done. Amen out of a love for God and his nation. Now, I want to stop there for a minute because, listen, if our love for God and for God's people is not enough to motivate us to get focused on what God wants us to do, then we need to reestablish a love connection with God, and when we do, reestablish a love connection with God's people, no matter what they look like, no matter what their history is, no matter how bad mistakes they've ever made, no matter how good that they ever were, because good people don't go to heaven either. It's saved people that go to heaven. So we've got to get focused, but we've got to have the love of God and love for God's people in order for a church to be built and to function the way that God desires and wants that to function. Can I have an amen? So true, you guys know that. I don't have to tell you that. So he goes down there, and you know what he does? He adapts to the situation that's in front of him. And in order for him to adapt, to understand everything that was about to take place, he had to hear from heaven. Let me tell you, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't an architect. He wasn't a, a construction guru. Listen, he needed some insight. Well, the good news is that God gives insight to those that he calls, to those that he wants to accomplish something, God blesses, God enables, God has the ability, he's the master carpenter, and so all we've got to do is adapt our frame of mind to God's frame of mind and say, God, I, I know that you've got this, I just need some foresight, I need to know what the plan is, I need to know how to make this work, I need to be able to persevere till this job is done. He recognized his weaknesses. Sometimes it's hard for us not, to, we'll recognize our weaknesses, but most time we want to use our weaknesses in order for us not to accomplish what God wants to accomplish. He recognized his weaknesses in order for God to be able to meet his weaknesses. And truly, he, I think he had the mind of Paul, when I am weak, it's when I'm the strongest. And so he recognized his weaknesses, and in the process, God instructed him in how it needed to be accomplished. And there's a, a chapter over there, it's chapter 5, I believe it is, where it talks about how that he, uh, and I've got it underlined in my Bible, and next to him, and next to him, go, go over there and read that this afternoon. Because uh, Nehemiah put a person here, and then next to him he put a person here, and next to him he put a person here, and next to him he put a person here. He put people side by side, teaming up, working together, so that the, they could accomplish. God gave them a plan. Now, the truth is, God's plan still works, and next to you is somebody that'll help you. Next to you is somebody that'll help you get through, and next to him is somebody that will encourage him. When the church comes together, one mind, one accord, and we're focused on what we need to accomplish and what we want to see to get done. Well, the, now, I don't know if you understand this or not, but they, the walls, uh, they built the walls, and then he assigned people to build the gates, and in 52 days, they reestablished the walls and the gates for the temple. So then they were able to start collecting the, the, the cups and the equipment to refill the temple so that everything could go back the way that it had to be. Amen? Now, the truth is that walls do two things, and I, I don't want to get through this message without talking about it for a minute. Listen, walls do two things, and gates do two things. One thing, they keep things from coming in, and the other thing is they keep things from going out. Now, I know in my heart that there are a lot of people that's got walls up. And Susan and I, we've prayed for people many times in our lives, especially since we've been pastor, who lived in a walled city already. But they had put walls up that kept people out. And they put walls up that kept God out. And they shut doors that God couldn't get in. Now, I'm not saying that there's anybody in the room today who's got some walls built up that keeps God and the church and the message out. But listen, we live in a world where it's a great walled city. And the only way that we're going to get inside and break down those walls is through the power of God's Word. 
Now, what I know in my heart is that we've got walls, but we've also got gates. And the trouble is, the problem is, that we don't always have our gates shut. And answer me this question, what good are walls if we don't know how to shut our gates? We come, we get saved, we're born again, we get baptized, our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Heaven, we join a, a group of people that loves us, and we love them, and we... Try, begin to try to adhere to what we want to try to adhere to in the Word of God, and we build our walls, but we also have our gates that we don't, we're not sure we want to shut this gate yet. Now, you may be here today, and you have some gates that need to be shut. And all this whole year, we've been talking about some obstacles and some things that might be in our life, some weights, some sin, some things that need to be kept out. And the only way to keep something out is to shut a gate. It's to recognize that as long as it's open, then the devil's just going to keep coming in and coming out, coming in and coming out. Now, when we recognize something that's severe, something that's really troubling us, listen, you're quick to shut that gate. And if you're not, you better step up your game because you better be quick. And sometimes we can be very deceived. You ever read the story or watch the movie, The Trojan Horse? You know, they brought into that city that great big wooden horse as a gift, and inside that was it, it was full of soldiers. They couldn't get inside that city uh, because they had their gates shut. So they deceived them into believing they were receiving this great big statue, a wooden horse, but inside of it were soldiers. So they were deceived. And sometimes the devil's good at what he does. Amen. If you haven't figured that out, learn that lesson. The devil is good about what he does. And he can make things look really good. In fact, the Bible says he can transform himself into an angel of light. And so he deceives people and believing, hey, I, I, saw, I saw an angel. I saw, oh, it had to be God. Listen, try every spirit. That's what the Bible says. Try every spirit. You have to put these things on trial and make sure that it was God and it has to be a faith. You've got to know from the Word, hey, that had to be God. It was good. It was not leading me astray. It didn't go against anything that I know was right, so it had to be God. But sometimes when things just sound good, feel good, taste good, listen, we just say, well, it can't be bad. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but sometimes things that are good are bad. And sometimes some things that look bad are actually good. Amen or oh man. If I got my walls up but my gates are open, I'm still subject to my temple being polluted. Now there's the, there's the message that I'll make sure you go home with. If you got your walls up but your gates are open, your temple is still subject to being polluted. Now there was a method to get into the Holy of Holies. And you didn't get in there where God was unless you were clean. And so if I come into there polluted and I don't get cleaned up, I never get a hold of God. And if I don't get a hold of God, I never experience the joy of the Lord. And if I don't experience the joy of the Lord, I never get strong enough to fight my battles, strong enough to shut those gates. And there are way too many people in the body of Christ who have no strength and they can't shut the gates to their walls to keep the enemy out. Because they lack it. Now this sermon might not be for anybody in this room. It may be for those who watch us on camera. But I'm telling you that the message is the same for all of us. That we've got to look inside. We need to look. Do I have a gate open? Do I have one ajar? Do I have, are they cracked open enough the devil can sneak in? Because he's, listen, he's, he's crafty. He's subtile more than any other beast of the field. And he has the ability to deceive like no one else has. So we have to ask our question, what kind of walls do I have built? Do I have walls that are strong? Do I have walls that the devil can't get through? Do I have walls built that protect those that are within it? If you're in here today and you're a father, you're the head of your household, listen, you're the high priest there, you're going to have to build your walls tall, stout, and strong and learn how to shut the gates because you're going to have to get your family, your friends, as many as you can, especially your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. That's in my future, I hope, someday. Listen into this to in for protection. The walls were for protection. The walls for, were to keep the enemy out. The walls were to give people security. We need to be safe and secure in our salvation. 
We don't need to go through life questioning every day. Listen, if you got your walls built up good, you don't even have to post somebody on it to watch. Preacher will do that for you. Watchman on the wall. We got to get to that place where I, I feel very confident about my relationship with God. And it doesn't matter if the trumpet sounds in the morning, noon, or night. I'm going to be ready to go. I got my lamps trimmed and burning. I don't have anything inside destroying my temple. I can go into the Holy of Holies and sacrifice to the God that I serve. I can come boldly to the throne of grace where I find mercy and help anytime that I have a need and feel confident about it that God not only heard my prayer, but he's also going to answer my prayer. There are a lot of people that are confident when it comes to praying, but not are, are not as confident when it comes to believing that God is going to answer that prayer. Sometimes we lack some things, and it's called doubt that puts us in a position where that it uh, opens a ground, opens a door for fear and unbelief. And so we keep praying, and we keep praying. We lack something. And there's something about Nehemiah. Listen, he persevered. He persevered. And, and I, I, I want to share these with you. I don't know how long. Uh, maybe we'll get through all of them. In chapter 2 in Nehemiah, verse 19 and 20, there were some things that came. I call them fiery darts. Now, listen, right off the bat, when Nehemiah went to do a job for God, his enemy arose. And the Bible says that Sambal at the horn night, and Tobiah the, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian, they heard it. They heard that Nehemiah was coming back and they were going to rebuild the walls and they were going to rebuild the gate. And so right off the bat, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? You're going to rebel against the king? Listen, I don't know if you've ever been ridiculed for your faith, if you've ever been called a wacko, a Jesus freak, or whatever other name, you know, that a religious fanatic. If you haven't been... Maybe you haven't taken enough of a stand in our society, in our world. When I was a teenager and I got saved and I was going to church and I, I was wearing a cross around my neck and carrying the Way Bible, and this was a long time ago. Most of you don't even know what the Way Bible was. Some of you might. I guess I could show you one. Then they changed the Way into Living Bible, and, and then preachers started preaching against it because it changed some things. But regardless, they just, I, I got labeled as a Jesus freak. And then, of course, that song came out. I, I related well to it. You know what? I don't care to be a fool for Christ's sake, do you? But you know what? Most Christians, most of us, we don't like to be ridiculed. We don't laugh, like to be laughed to scorn. We don't like to be told, who do you think you are? Right off the bat, Nehemiah had to deal with something that most of us have dealt with our whole lives. Because we never thought that we stood up. People laughed about us, talked about us. Listen, when we, when we began this ministry 32 years ago, this coming March, listen, you know what? The first thing that we began to hear was ridicule and laughing. Who do you think you are? What right do you think you have? What are you doing coming and burning? I, we, we heard it. I heard it. We were told it. People that we thought cared about us, listen, they laughed. They scorned. They ridiculed. You know what I did? I did what Nehemiah did. I overcame it by the confidence that God gave me. Listen, when you're walking by faith, you, have, you can have a confidence that when you hear these things, you'll know that it's not that person, it's the devil behind it. They're fiery darts. It's the kind of thing that without faith in your life, it'll, it'll make you cry. It'll make you want to quit. It'll make you want to stop serving God. People laugh at you. They, they probably laugh, laugh at uh, my sister over here because she'll say, a church Sunday at 1030, come sit with me. I'm sure there's people who read that and they laugh. They put a little grin on their face and think, she puts that on every week. Nobody ever goes sits with her. Well, I got news for them. Brandon sits with her every week. Amen? One of these days, somebody else will come in and sit with her. And then later on, somebody else is going to come in and sit with her. We're not going to pay attention to the ridicule, to the contempt, to the scorn. We don't pay attention to it. If you, if you get up here and you try your best to sing because God told you to, listen, you can be off key like I would be, and it could sound terrible like I would be, and you know what? We're going to clap and say amen and love it because you're doing what God led you to do. Amen? And you know what? It'll touch somebody's heart. 
Because God knows what people have need of before we ever ask. And sometimes God will cause us to do something out of the ordinary. Nehemiah went down there to do something out of the ordinary. And so I'm sure the ridicule that he got was probably, it was like, well, you know, they were right. I'm not a carpenter. Yeah, they're, they're right. I don't know about building gates. They're, yeah, they're right. It would have been easy for him to have got discouraged before he ever got started. More discouragement coming their way. Don't you know they're working by the sweat of their brow? And some of them, they weren't all carpenters. They weren't all bricklayers. They, some of them probably thought, I don't, really don't know what I'm doing, but I'll give it my best shot. Listen, that's all that God expects from any of us. Give it our best shot. God will make it work. God will make it last. It will work out. If God's behind it and God's not in it, don't go for it. Let me tell you, they built those walls and there was no foxes that broke them down. We have to recognize the lie when we hear it, where it's coming from, and what spirit that it's coming out of. Nehemiah didn't get discouraged. And you know what? The, the, those that were working for him, the one that was next to him, and the one that was next to him, and the one that was next to him, you know what they did? They rehearsed the matter. They rehearsed what they heard in their ear. They didn't give place to, to buy the Ammonite. They heard what Nehemiah said. And they just kept building they prayed and they worked hard. You know where we make our biggest mistakes? We don't pray and work as hard as what we should pray and work as hard as what we should work. Verse number 6 in chapter 4 says, that's exactly what it said. We built, so we built we the wall. And all the wall was joined together into half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Now God would ask us that question today. You'd have to answer, do you have a mind to work? Do you have a mindset to work for God? To help build a wall, build some gates, protect the temple, make a sanctuary where people can come in? You know what? We've got to work at this ourselves. We don't succeed as Christians because we don't apply ourselves. If I don't work at not learning the word, I'll never learn the word. If I don't work at loving people, I'll never love people. Listen, people aren't just all lovable. You know, we love the babies. That's easy, right? But the person who walked in behind the baby may not be so lovable. And the ones who despitefully use us, listen, you're going to have to work really hard at looking over their nonsense, looking over their ridicule, looking over their hatred, looking over their contempt. The ones the devil's trying to use to get to you. You've got to work at forgiving and work at forgetting and work at moving forward and not paying attention to what they want you to pay attention to because if you do, it becomes a distraction and distractions are what stop us in our tracks. That's what keeps us from accomplishing. They had a mind to work. I don't care what they do, we're going to get this wall built. We get this wall built, we're going to put some gates in it. And then we're going to get this temple up and going. They had a mind to work. Well, you know what? The enemy doesn't quit. Tobiah and the Ammonite, the sand ballot, they didn't quit. They just come and you read right on down there in verses 7 and 8. You know what they came against them the next time? This time they began to conspire against them. So it came to pass that when Samballot, Tobiah, and the Arabians, and the Ammonites, and the Ashes, listen, they went out and got them some help. It wasn't just three guys. Now they're like, okay, guys, come help us. We're going to have to get this stopped. The devil doesn't stop. He just goes and gets more to help him. And that they heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they, they were very mad. They began to show hatred. They did not want Jerusalem rebuilt. And they knew the walls couldn't keep them out, but when the breaches, when the gates were beginning to be built, they're like, we've got to do something to stop this. Listen, when the devil doesn't get you the first time and he doesn't get you the second time, he'll come against you again. And the next time he comes against you, he'll bring reinforcement. He's like, well, they may, have, they may have withstood my attack before, but let's see if they can withstand this one. You're going to be tested, and you're going to be tried. And if your confidence ain't in God, if you're not ready to pray and work hard at remaining steadfast and committed to God, you'll let these distractions stop your progress. And if they stop your gates from being built, your worship in the temple will not be there. We've got to learn how to worship God. Well, you know what they did? They set up a watch. They're like, okay, we're going to have to pay attention. And then they prayed even harder. Let me tell you, 
They didn't just pray, they prayed harder. Sometimes it's the effectual, fervent prayer of righteous men and women that has to come forth so that we can avail much. There was a conspiracy against them to keep the gates from being built. If you haven't figured it out yet, there is a conspiracy against you and against your family to keep them out of church, to keep them from being born again, to keep them from serving God, trying to discourage you to the point that eventually you would turn and walk away because it became too much. That's why it requires more prayer. When you feel yourself being pulled and you feel yourself getting weak and you get to a place where you think, well, just well quit or just well give up, you're going to experience some emotions and some feelings that you can't stop until you recognize, you watch what the devil's doing, and then you just begin to pray and come against them. You have to see. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, you have to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that understand what's going on. We have to discern right from wrong and the truth from the lie and be able to know that, hey, they're, they're, you're trying to get me down, devil, but you're, it's not going to work. Sometimes we have to suck it up and put on our big boy pants and we've got to go to work for God. And while we're working for God, we're working for ourselves. And you know, one of the worst ones, Nehemiah faced one of the worst ones next. When you read on down in there, verses 10 and 12, you'll find out that it, it wasn't just the enemy. Then all of a sudden, and Judah said, Judah said, that's the separated kingdom, Judah and Israel. Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burden is decayed and there's so much rubbish, so we're not able to build the wall. All of a sudden, discouragement came from their friends, from the people who were closest to them. The people who should have been supportive. The people who should have said, I admire what you're doing. The people who said it, should have said, I'll, I'll support you in whatever that you want to undertake. Listen, discouragement will come. Jesus said in the last days, sometimes the enemies would be they of her own household. That father would turn against son and mother against daughter and family members against other family members. Yeah, there's sometimes there's discouragement. Some of you have already experienced this in your lifetime. Some of them laughed at you when you got saved and you started going to church. There's people got laughed at. You go down there to Brother to Dale's church, Word of Faith family, because they don't all, they don't all understand. We've been ridiculed over our offering <laughs> confession time and time and time again. You know what we do? We just keep saying it. Amen. And it didn't come from people who weren't in church. It came from people who were in church. It came from the people that you think, they ought to know better. Where'd that come from? Why would you say such a thing? Why won't you support me? Why, don't, why won't you get behind this? Nehemiah, he recognized it. You know what he did? He's, he remained steadfast fast in front of all that discouragement and you know what there's not a person who doesn't feel it sometimes I don't know a person who doesn't get discouraged on occasion you've been sick for two weeks it's easy to get discouraged ain't it brother B yeah you've been trying to get something accomplished and, and nothing seems to be working I've had people tell me brother Dale doesn't seem to be working I don't know what I'm going to do you know what that's the sound of discouragement Looks like I'm going to have to live with this one. That's the sound of discouragement. I don't guess I'm ever going to get better. That's the sound of discouragement. I can't find a job. Pays enough money to pay my bills. That's a discouragement. That's us saying I can't. And when I say I can't, that's what's, then we're saying that God can't. That's not being an I can person, an I am person who knows that God's got this and I will stay steadfast to the course. That's why I love the song that Kelly sang. Yeah. Steadfast to the course. I'm not going to change my mind because somebody in the world that got me discouraged. I heard something that didn't sit well, didn't feel good. You go out today and, and tell me that was a terrible sermon and I'm not going to be discouraged by it because I'm going to know that it must have hit you right between the eyes because God gave it to me for a time like this. And if it wasn't for you, it's for somebody or somebody who's listening because the truth is we've got to get our temples protected so that we can reestablish true worship within it, enter into the Holy of Holies, clean as a pen, get right before the throne of God and let God just fill our hearts with the joy of the Lord so that we can go right back out of the court, back out into the world, strong and able to accomplish everything that we need to accomplish. 
and march right up to one of them doors that we left open and shut that door and say, no, devil, you're not getting back in here. Uh, you have no place in this place, and I am kicking you out, and you've got to go and slam the door on them. But if I never get in the Holy of Holies, I never get the strength to shut that gate. So I've got to persevere. I've got to keep fighting. I've got to recognize the enemy's attempt to get me in doubt. I can't allow any other roadblocks in my life to keep me from getting my temple where God wants it to be. You know what they faced after that? I didn't have them put scripture. We're going to have to read the whole chapter. Listen, there were some of them that were selfish and greedy, and they wanted some things for themselves. Listen, you'll find that in life. You'll find that among your closest friends sometimes. And you know what requirement of God there is for all of us? That's selflessness. Willing to sacrifice whatever I have to sacrifice for God's service. To do what God wants. Listen, if he he asks, whatever he asks, you give it to him. Whatever he expects, just go ahead and go for it. I'm telling you, God will replace it with more than what you ever would have experienced when you refuse to be selfish and greedy. No complaining. Making those self-sacrifices to God. God, uh, yeah, God. Okay, God, I hear you. Okay, God, that's a door that needs to be shut. Okay, God, I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need some help. God doesn't ask you to clean your life up by yourself. God asked for you to let him help you clean up, to rebuild your walls, to rebuild your gates, to put hinges on them that don't squeak, some that you don't require the whole body to help you push. But let me tell you, when you're trying to shut a gate and you're having problems, listen, we'll be our brother's keeper, and we'll go there and stand with you to help shut those gates because we've all, you and me alike, We've got to get our temples clean. And we've got to protect our temple. And we've got to shut those gates. Amen. And in chapter number 6, verse number 15, there was a verse scripture I wanted to close with. And it said that the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month, Elu, in 52 days. Listen, the work is not done until it's finished. The work is not done until it's finished. How guilty are we of starting a project, getting a little discouraged, leaving it right where it was, right where it was. I had a friend of mine one time, he'd work on his car, and when he'd get done, he'd lay his tools down. Six weeks later, uh, his tools would be laying in the same place that it was. And maybe the vehicle was fixed, and maybe it wasn't. And he left his tools there because he's going to come back and finish it one day. And you know what? We got Christians who operate in the same principle. We started on a project, we got started on something, but our work is not done. If it's not done, it's not finished. When Jesus hung on the cross, he finished the work. And now he expects you and I, when we start something, all right, to finish it. And if I got gates open, they need shut. And if they haven't been built, let's build those gates. Let's work at building our gates. Let's work at drawing uh, from God's word the material that is required for me to shut that gate on whatever that it might be. Now, we talked about some things earlier, and I'm not even going to go there. Listen, you know, you know your own life better than anybody here. I know my life, you know yours, but God knows them all. And God knows the gates that are open, and he knows the gates that haven't been built, and sometimes he knows the walls that have been put up, because sometimes walls were put up to keep him out, and sometimes walls are put up to keep him in. Listen, I want my walls to be strong to keep him in. And I want my gates to be strong to keep the enemy out. And I want to be able to bring my own into my place for protection. I want to cover them with the love of God, the peace of God. And I want to be strong in the Lord and the power of his mind so that I can go forth with the joy of the Lord being my strength. Because when I need strength, I know that it's there. And we can draw upon that. Amen. I'm telling you, God loves us. He wants the best from us. They were building the walls and the gates to protect the temple. Listen up, children. 
You approach each day your battles. Don't let your hearts faint. Fear not, do not tremble, neither be afraid. For the Lord our God is he that goes with us to fight for us against all of our enemies to keep us safe. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and is gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you his peace. Amen. 